Melody Harris shot him, concealed his death by putting him on a burn pile on their property like he was trash. When you add this up, that someone who weighs 120 pounds can move this. That is a doubt. We're on a verdict watch this morning in the Burn Pile murder trial. A Georgia jury deciding if there's reasonable doubt that Melody Ferris didn't murder her husband. Court TV cameras are bringing you every movement in the courtroom as we wait for the jury's decision. And if Melody Ferris is found not guilty, then we're getting questions about what could happen to Scott Ferris. Could he face prosecution? His mother's fate could tip the scales. We'll talk about that. Also this hour, the Los Angeles DA is flagging his clemency request for the Menendez brothers. We're talking about whether this means that the judge may want to keep the brothers behind bars. Plus, my exclusive interview with Marsha Thompson. She's revealing how her daily life is still impacted by her murder trial. It's all coming up next for you right here on Opening Statements. Good Thursday morning to you, or should I say happy Halloween? Welcome to Opening Statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant. I say this program is kind of like coffee and court. It's morning time. We get warmed up together for the big day ahead on Court TV Live. So go ahead, grab that cup of coffee right now. It's time for my opening statement. <music> Trick or treat. That is what three-year-old Elijah Vu should be saying on this Halloween. He should be able to dress up in a costume and enjoy the candy that he gets from his neighbors. But sadly, Elijah won't get to do that because he's dead. Wisconsin neighbors who would be looking forward to welcoming him as a trick-or-treater tonight were out searching far and wide for him after he disappeared. That precious angel deserved to grow up and have a happy, healthy, safe, fun childhood. Instead, investigators believe he was tortured. The medical examiner noting trauma to Elijah's head that occurred weeks before his death. Now his mother and her boyfriend are facing charges for it. Katrina Bauer and Jesse Vang. And you know what's most frightening on this Halloween is how those two were parenting Elijah. The allegations are nauseating and so is their alleged cover up. But the truth always comes out. Little Elijah Vu may be gone, but he is certainly not forgotten. May that precious angel get justice. And may the dirty, rotten scumbags who took his life and abused him pay the price. That's my opening statement. Let me know if you like it right now. It's time for your daily docket. This case is about Gary Wayne Ferris. And you're here because Melody Ferris shot him, concealed his death by putting him on a burn pile on their property like he was trash. In Georgia, jury deliberations expected to resume this morning at 9 a.m. in the burn pile murder trial against Melody Farris. In Indiana, the state could rest in the Delphi murders case. No cameras allowed, as you know. We've got our Court TV team, though, in the courtroom. Our senior producer, Barbara McDonald, is going to have updates for you all throughout the day. And in Wisconsin, we've got a preliminary hearing set for Samantha Krebs. She's accused of murdering her boyfriend and then asking her friends to lie and tell police that he killed her himself. Court's going to start up at 3 p.m. in that one. Our top story this morning is the Burn Pal murder case in the hands of the jury right now. Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson is in Georgia with the very latest on the case. Julie, good morning. Today is day two of deliberations in the Burn Pile murder trial. Defendant Melody Ferris waits outside the courthouse as her jury of six men and six women deliberate her fate. The weeks-long trial included 44 witnesses and more than 1,200 exhibits. Ferris is accused of killing her attorney husband Gary back in 2018 and throwing his body onto the backyard burn pile. On Wednesday, attorneys in the case delivered their final arguments, prosecutors stressing the money and a new life with her boyfriend as a motive. 
while the defense blaming her son Scott and ending with this powerful demonstration. But I think it starts to become clear why I'm doing this, why am I dropping these bags? These bags are 40 pounds a piece. I've got a few more bags to go. When you add this up, that someone who weighs 120 pounds can move this. This is 320 pounds. I am 185 pounds. And that's all I have. This is all the money she would get if Gary died accidentally. Add all those up. Okay, $4.15 million. It was always about money, money, money. Melanie was demanding money. She was trying to get as much money as possible. And deliberations resume this morning. All parties are told to be within 15 minutes of the courthouse here behind me in case there is a jury question or a verdict. Julie. Our thanks to Matt Johnson for that early update. Now I've got two great trial attorneys standing by to talk about the advocacy that we saw in the courtroom during those closing arguments. I want to welcome them. And now trial attorney Tad Thomas and criminal defense attorney and law professor Dante Mills. Good morning to you gentlemen. Dante, I want to begin with you please on the bag demonstration. And so I want you to go into trial ad professor mode for us and look at this from both sides, the defense side and then what the prosecution perhaps should have done on their side. Happy Halloween. Uh, <laughs> Thank this, you. This, this, one is you a, this is a fun one, right? We were ready. Yeah. Everybody was, was in character uh, for this closing <laughs> argument. I think it's fitting that we're talking about it on Halloween. Uh, it was a demonstration that there was an attempt to show by the defense attorney that what, it would have been nearly impossible for this defendant to drag her husband's body uh, that type of a distance. I think it was a good demonstration. I don't know if this was the highlight of the case. And usually what you want to do is pick the highlight of the case to make this kind of a demonstration on a point that you know you can't be wrong on. If I'm the other side, I'm saying, well, maybe she just used something to pull or drag his body with. Uh, case, you know, it, it's that's an easy solution. So I don't know if you should demonstrate things where one fact changes, like a wheelbarrow or or like some kind of pulley or some kind of rope that she tied around him and then drug him, um, where it would just it would just erase your entire demonstration. So I don't know if this was the, the key fact that he should have hung his hat on. And when you do a demonstration like that, that means that's the most important part of your case. And if the jury doesn't buy that, then they may find your client guilty just because they don't buy that that demonstration that you threw in front of their face. Dante, thanks. Ted, tell me, uh, if you were on the side of the prosecution with that demo, prosecution side, how quickly would you have been standing up and objecting? Oh, I wouldn't have objected. I would have waited till my turn to get up and do my rebuttal because. Oh, you know, like okay. Said, what would you have done? Like, oh my gosh, you know, the Egyptians built the pyramids without cranes and, you know, trucks and bulldozers or anything else. We don't necessarily know how they did it, but they got it done. I don't have to prove how they got it done. All we know is they did it. And so that's what I'd stand up and say in closing argument. Okay. I came up with that in about 30 seconds here. Okay, I, I like it. I like it. Uh, I would have been out of my seat so fast, like a, a jumping bean, if I was the prosecution, if I was the defense. I, I was kind of loving it because it spiced things up. You know, it, it was just a way to spice things up and, and get a little bit of... Um, you know, question before this jury in their minds that when you see this attorney trying to drag those bags, but they're also not in case evidence. You know, the, the prosecution could have objected to that, and uh, but they didn't, so it's all in. Um, I want to play for you what the state did in their close. So they started off with something pretty powerful, I thought, this audio call between lovers, Rusty and Melody. Let's take a listen to that together. I remember you telling me he's on the burn pile. Mm-hmm. Were, you know, were you lying about Scott? Did Scott, I mean, this, do you think, what, that, I don't, that, I, you tell me, go ahead. I can tell you that there should not have been as much damage as there was done. I don't know what that means. 
that body should not have been burned up. Dante Mills, I want to go back to you. What did you think of how the state started things off? I think they have a very impossible case, uh, nearly. How do you prove uh, who did this? There's so many things going on uh, with so many people in, in this situation. Uh, you have a, a missing gun with the cousin. You have a son who was living upstairs in the barn. So they have to narrow in on this defendant specifically. Uh, they focused on motive, money, which is such an easy motive uh, because he wasn't giving her money. He was giving it to their adult children. Um, I think they have a nearly impossible case. And I don't know if this was strong enough. I don't think that a strong enough argument where they eliminated everybody else and everybody else and that's what they had to do. Um, they tried to, to do what they could to show that this it was Ferris who, who, who had reason to commit this murder, but there were so many other people who had reason to commit this murder. Um, I, I'm not saying that this attorney did a bad job. I just think that it was nearly impossible with the facts that she had to eliminate everybody else, even if you have you know some kind of phone call trying to show that she was in it. I think she muddied that up enough that I, I don't think this jury is going to be able to deliberate and come back with the guilty verdict. They may be there for a long time and come back with a hung verdict, a hung jury, or I think they're gonna come back with the not guilty. All right, there's your prediction. Oh, we shall see. I, I have another clip where the defense is closing and they're pointing the finger squarely at Scott Ferris, the son of Melody and Gary, the victim. Let's watch. He was in control from the very first minute of this case, Scott Ferris. Scott Ferris was always in control. And the fact that he had to immediately control the case, to me, shows doubt. Tad Thomas, if she's acquitted, like Dante's predicting, this is going to be a very uncomfortable Thanksgiving at the Ferris house. Uh, what do you think of this savage defense to point the finger at the child that she birthed? Well, you know, I'm sure they, there's some discussion of this going into it because, you know, like Dante said, this is a very, very tough case for the prosecutor. And as soon as there's, there's an acquittal in this case, they don't have much better evidence against the sign, as far as I know. So, you know, it's maybe it's a coordinated defense. And, you know, there was some discussion about this going into this because if they try to prosecute the son, they're going to point the finger at the mom because that jury won't hear what happened in this courtroom. Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this case a little later in the show about what happens if there's an acquittal, right? I've been getting lots of questions about whether or not Scott could be prosecuted or if I think he will be. So that is coming up. Uh, Ted and Dante, you're staying with us. We're so grateful for that. Stand by, please. Coming up next here on Opening Statements, here's what we've got. I've spent so many years blaming myself for so many things. It's just like one more thing to blame myself for. And all the consequences after that for me and my children. A very special guest joins Court TV. Marsha Thompson sits down with me for an exclusive interview that you don't want to miss. Plus, could the Menendez brothers be spending the holiday season with their families? We're going to talk about the latest big push from the Los Angeles County DA to get them home for the holidays. Tonight on Court TV. These are the big cases that everyone is talking about. A lot of new developments taking place. Shocking. I know who killed. John Bonet, to say the least. You cannot make this stuff up. It's not unreal. The scene of the double murders is behind us right here. Things are happening. The investigation is continuing. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan. Tonight at 8, 7 Central. Only on Court TV. I mean, it was obvious that it was true. And, uh, and I, I just didn't feel my brother was going to, you know, there was no reason to lie. Clearly, he was coming to me, wanted me to do something about it. And, uh, and it was true, because, you know, my dad never denied it when I talked to him about it. 
Lahal and Eric Menendez's quest for freedom is what's trending in true crime as the Los Angeles County DA voices his support for the brothers' bid for clemency. According to the LA Times, the brothers' attorney submitted a request for clemency to California Governor Gavin Newsom, a move that could set the brothers free without resentencing. Now, on Wednesday, DA Gascon posted this statement on Instagram saying, quote, I strongly support clemency for Eric and Lau Menendez, who are currently serving life sentences uh, without the possibility of parole. They have respectively served 34 years and have continued their educations and worked to create new programs to support the rehabilitation of fellow inmates. Here's Gascon on the divide within his office over the potential release of the killers. I have to tell you unequivocally that we don't have a universal agreement. Uh, there are people in the office uh, that strongly believe that the Menendez brothers should stay in prison the rest of their life. And they do not believe that they were molested. And there are people in the office that strongly believe that they should be released immediately. So will the governor go for the clemency bid? Let's talk about it this morning. I'm going to bring in our power panel, trial attorney Ted Thomas, criminal defense attorney and law professor Dante Mills, and entertainment reporter and the host of Kinsey Schofield Unfiltered on YouTube, Kinsey Schofield. Big welcome to you all. All right, so I want to start by playing for you a clip, clip of Deputy DA in the LA County DA's office, John Lewin. You might recognize that name, famously prosecuted Robert Durst, a really, really solid trial attorney. And he came on Vinny's show the other night, and he is one of the people in that office right now who is fuming about George Gascon's decision to support these brothers. Let's take a look at what John Lewin said. Well, here's the problem. One, you got a resentencing that's based on abuse that has not been documented or proved. Instead of George Gascon doing a complex and thorough investigation, he rushes this thing through so that he can attempt to salvage his doomed reelection campaign. And then he holds a press conference before he's even gone into court. Apparently he's now posting Kim Kardashian comments. I'm sure Rosie O'Donnell is next. Um, what kind of office is this? John Lewin tells it like it is. That's for sure. Not holding back here on his opinion. Uh, so big divide in that office, uh, which is potentially a problem. Um, Dante Mills, would you start us off, please? Your thoughts on what's going on with the Menendez brothers? I think this is disappointing uh, for the DA to take this position. It's absolutely political. Uh, he has a campaign that's coming up. He was 30 points behind uh, when he held this press conference saying that he's decided that the Menendez brothers, uh, and he called them the Menendez boys, which is a little bizarre because they're in their 60s at this point, um, that they've done what they had to do, that they've served their time and done it well. That's not his job to do that. The district attorney doesn't decide that a prisoner has done a good job in prison, so now they should not have to serve the sentence that they receive. It's selective prosecution, and he's inserting himself somewhere he should not be. What does that look like for the people who truly have evidence that's exonerating them, and they're still with no district attorney, specifically this district attorney, going to bat for them, even though there's evidence showing that they didn't do a crime? In this particular case, True crime played a role. It became a phenomenon. It's on the internet. Netflix picked up the special. Kim Kardashian is involved, so he's inserting himself. That's not what our justice system should be. Um, and I think it's it's a bad move that really calls into question all the steps that he's taken as a district attorney. Is it about him or is it about protecting the public? Preach, my friend, preach. I love everything you just said. When we think about how savage this crime was, um, perhaps that is being overlooked some with this Menendez mania that's going on. I, I mean, these guys I mean, shot their parents with shotguns at close range, even went out to their cars, reloaded, and came back in and fired more shots. Uh, this was an ambush. It was as brutal a crime scene as you could imagine. And, and yet they are like 
popular uh, because of, of these true crime series, as Dante noted. Are people overlooking the plain facts? Kinsey Schofield, let me go to you on this point, please. Your thoughts. I mean, I think that you've all made very good points at this point in time. Um, I will say here in Los Angeles, the tone, especially from some of the Beverly Hills officers, is that this is a publicity stunt. Um, under George Gascon, incidents of murder, aggravated assault, forcible rape, and other violent crimes are up over 5% theft and property crime during his first three years in office, up 24%. He doesn't have the best reputation. Uh, and he is being accused of using this as an opportunity for some pro a positive press right before the election. But it, we have access to so much horrible stuff today that we didn't back then. I mean, we don't immediately associate this crime with the crime scene. We associate it with the courtroom. And I think that, it, you know, we have become um, almost numb um, to, I think that if we would have seen some of those images of the of the family, it would be harder for us to justify. But because all we see is the tearful uh, the tearful men in the courtroom, that is why you see this taking over TikTok, and that's why you're seeing pe people sympathize because we've lost the victims in all of this. Kinsey, I love everything you said. When you said we associate the case with the courtroom, bingo, bingo, you're spot on. That's when these brothers and people are feeling sympathetic for them. And meanwhile, what John Lewin shared, and he's in that office. He has served in that office far longer than the current DA has. And he's saying these allegations these brothers are making haven't been substantiated. These, these accusations of sex abuse haven't even been proven to be true. And he notes that Lal and Eric, particularly Lal, according to John Lewin, has a history of fabricating evidence for purposes of the trial. Uh, Dad Thomas, what are your thoughts on this, especially within that government office when you have your rank and file, your good people who are serving day in and day out, they've, they're in the trenches, so to speak, doing the heavy lifting, and, and they are furious about the decision coming from the top that uh, could perhaps be political. You know, I guess I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate here because the fact of the matter is, is even as an elected prosecutor, he has to follow the facts and he has to follow the law. Now, is he going about it the right way? I, I don't disagree with Dante at all. We have a process. There are, you know, the resentencing. There's the habeas process that's going on right now. You know, should the prosecutor probably stay out of the clemency part? Absolutely. But to the, to the effect that there is new evidence in the case, they should follow it. They should go to get it substantiated. They should follow the process and have the court rule on this. Uh, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to criticize him for trying to do the right thing. I'm not going to assume that just because he's running for office that he doesn't feel in his heart that these boys were molested and uh, you know that there was a. a certainly a crime here, but is it a crime that should have kept them in uh, prison for the rest of their lives? You know, let the process work out. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for taking the other side uh, for purposes of this discussion. It's important, and we know that the public is split. Um, there, there are a lot of opinions on this one, and they're just appearing in the headlines every day, as you all know. And now uh, there, there's a new headline for them. Apparently, uh, the Halloween plans for these guys is being talked about, uh, with today being the Halloween holiday. So according to TMZ, Stephen King's It Candy Salad, uh, chip and chips and cookies, microwavable popcorn, soda, and do-it-yourself taffy made by mixing creamer and Kool-Aid are all going to be available to the Menendez brothers behind bars today. I guess a candy salad is where you take all the candy you can find that's available at the commissary <laughs> department and you, you bring it back uh, and you, you enjoy just mixing it all together in a big bowl. That's a candy salad in prison, apparently. And uh, with this legal battle, they're set to go to court on December 11th. Uh, December 11th, the judge could make a decision uh, on whether or not they will be resentenced. Apparently, there's a date before that, November the 25th, where they intend to ask the judge to sign off on a change of the conviction from murder to manslaughter, which would then get the ball rolling for that December 11th date. But in the meantime, we're asking, uh, since those dates are, are coming up on, on the uh, holiday season, uh, the Christmas season, we're wondering, do we think these guys could be out? by Christmas? 
Let's bring back in our power panel and talk about this. So realistically, what do we think will happen here? Ted Thomas, I'll start with you this time. You know, I think the only way that they're out that quickly is through the clemency process, and which is obviously a political process. Uh, you know, like the other guests have established, and you mentioned, you know, every day something's coming out about these. So if if it follows the political process, it's certainly possible. I think if, if it follows the legal process, I, I don't see how they get out that quickly. Sure, I appreciate that. And and if they do, how might they be treated by the public? Um, you know, we know they grew up in Beverly Hills. Will they return to Beverly Hills? Who knows? Uh, Kinsey, tell me, uh, what do you think is the public sentiment with them? Are they being treated like celebrities? Do you think they're going to be treated that way if they're out? I mean, yeah, yes. I don't think they're going to gypsy rose it. I don't think they're going to try to take advantage of it. I think that they will probably go away, and, and I would advise them to do so as well. Appreciate that so much, uh, Kinsey. Thank you for that. I know we have to let you get going. Uh, be sure to check out Kinsey's show on YouTube. Uh, and we love having her on this show. Thank you so much, friend. We'll see you soon. Still ahead here on Opening Statements. With respect to Terry, I want to talk to you about your husband, Terry. Do you still miss him? When I think about good times, yeah. My exclusive interview with Marsha Thompson is coming up next. She shares how she's been doing and what she's been doing since her murder trial. The fact that she shot him nine times tells you a lot. She wanted to make sure he was really dead. Marsha Thompson exercised her legal right and her human right to defend her own life. Verdict, not guilty. Welcome back to Opening Statements. I'm Julie Grant. Right now, we're shining the spotlight on a former defendant who is trying to rebuild her life after she was found not guilty of murdering her husband. We watched the trial of Marsha Thompson play out live on court TV. She shot and killed her husband, Terry, in 2019, following what she described as years of abuse. Marsha Thompson says she was living in a constant state of fear and pulled the trigger in self-defense. After a little more than four hours, a Florida jury returned a verdict in her favor. Here with me today, Marsha Thompson and her attorney, Jessica Michali. It's wonderful to have you both here. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Marsha, I want to start with you, please. First question, just how are you doing? We're doing okay. Um, doing better every day. Uh, adjusting, trying to take things slow. It's hard, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. How are your kids? How are they doing? Um, they're doing okay. Um, they're getting used to me being back at home full time. Um, they still have a lot of healing to do. They've been in therapy from day one. Um, I'm in therapy, yeah. So that's gonna last probably for a long time. And that's great. You all are in therapy. I, I wanted to ask you about the, the healing process and what it's like rebuilding and healing from all that trauma that you've all been through. Uh, so for me, a big part of my life has been my faith in Jesus. Um, I try to instill that in the kids because that's the only way I've been able to get through uh, all the trauma of my life. The trial was also very difficult um, and just kind of going day to day and having a reason to get up every day. It was, I'm sure, hard for the jury to hear some of these facts. And Marsha, I know they didn't even hear the half of it. Uh, we got our hands on an old arrest report with your husband. This is September 4th of 2011. Um, and he had punched you in the face multiple times with a closed fist. You had multiple lacerations on your face, a big bump on your head, the officer noted. At this point in time, you were married four years and had one child at that point together. Um, how vivid are the memories of what your husband did to you? Um, I, t I mean, that incident in particular is difficult. Um, I usually try not to remember a lot of stuff. Um, but that one in particular, because my daughter was one year old at the time, and she was present 
is, is very difficult. You know, during your testimony, which was so emotional, uh, and we were all taking it in and, and thinking about being in your shoes, one of the jurors uh, commented about how it, it really swayed them thinking about the horrific things you went through. Uh, we've got a clip of that. Let's take a look at that together now. He continued to yell at me. He was threatening me. He was saying, you're going to call the police. I know I looked at you. You have blood all over you. You look horrible. And I promised him I was not going to call the police. Did you? I did not. He threatened to slit my throat. He said, I will kill you. You need to tell me the truth. I saw it with my own eyes repeating the same threats that he had said earlier about me flirting with somebody else. Uh, now, in that clip we just took, in that clip we just took a look at, uh, we know the jury felt like what you shared uh, really, really impacted them greatly. What was it like sharing it, giving that testimony? Extremely difficult. I didn't want to do it, but I felt I had to if I was going to fight for a chance to get back with my children. With respect to Terry, I want to talk to you about your husband, Terry. Do you still miss him? When I think about good times, yeah. How about your kids? Do they still miss him? Um, that's... Um, I probably shouldn't share what the kids, you know, their thoughts, but... Um, Understood. They, uh... Sorry, thank no, you. No, don't apologize. Oh. You're fine. Yeah. That's something they work on in therapy. Yeah, sure. Sure. It's, it's such a difficult conflict to have. And uh, thank you for being so open about this. Because when we think about legally, you've done nothing wrong, right? You're free and clear from, from any legal issues here in criminal court. However, the death must still stay with you morally. Do you ever struggle with that? I know that you're a woman of faith. Do you ever have difficulty with that? Very much. Yeah. yeah. And that's also something I'm dealing with in therapy. Sure. Working you know. through that, right? Yeah. To understand that you haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. Yes, and I've spent so many years blaming myself for so many things. It's just like one more thing to blame myself for. And all the consequences after that for me and my children. That is the cycle of abuse, where you're made to blame yourself for things that aren't your fault. Uh, Jessica Mashali has been a defense attorney for many, many years. Uh, Jessica, isn't that, I mean, this is so typical of the cycle of abuse, where a batterer makes their victim feel like they're in the wrong. Absolutely, that's a big part of the cycle of abuse, is that you are abused, physically abused. You're the victim. And then you're made to feel like it's your fault that ha that it's happened. And then before you know what, you're getting an apology and you have the honeymoon phase and you're feeling like everything's gonna be okay. Until around the corner, there it goes again. You're being abused again. And that cycle just goes on and on. And the longer it goes on, the more stuck the victim is. Marsha, in terms of trying to go back to a normal life, this has got to be really hard too. Wanted to ask you about that. So starting with, with work, are you working now again? Not right now, no. Okay. Any plans to work in, in the future? Yes, yeah. I, I definitely want to. Um, I'm still young and want to support, you know, be able to support my children and myself on my own. My family's been a huge support and friends also. Um, but I would like to be able to, you know, provide for myself and the kids. There was a lot of violence in your house and do you ever look back and think, my gosh, how am I still standing here today? Oh, yes, most definitely myself and the children. Um, and again, I, you know, I thank God so much that we are safe. The kids are safe. No matter what problems they have to face or I have still have to face for the rest of our life, that we're okay. Marcia, did Terry ever have any signals for you in public, like something that would be known only to you, that would be imperceptible to anybody else, that he was upset about something and there would be a consequence at home? Typically, it was a look. Um, I tried to really watch myself and surroundings, not to get into any situations, specifically with men, where it can be misconstrued. Um, and uh, sometimes he would pull me into the bathroom so he could privately tell me 
that he saw something or he suspected something. What would you say you learned about yourself going through this process? Uh, I can do things a lot harder than I thought I could, for sure. Because um, there was times I did not think I could do what, what I needed to do, what I knew was coming up, um, that I am a survivor. And I have to embrace it. I'm working on it still, but I'm trying, uh, you know, to have more self-confidence, more self-worth. Um, so that's probably the biggest things that I've learned. Right. And you look beautiful in this purple blouse you're wearing Thank today. You. Did you know that it happens to be the color for domestic violence awareness? I and do. it is yes. Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So how perfect you wore this today with your attorney. Uh, every good wish to you, Marsha, as you continue rebuilding and regaining uh, everything that has been uh, lost in your life uh, since this, this horrific uh, incident. Uh, we wish you and your kids the very best. Thank you for everything this morning. And thanks to Jessica Mashali. Uh, through your trial, we got a wonderful new legal analyst here on our network. Thank you both. Thank you for having Thank me. You so much. And Marsha shared with me off camera that the reason she agreed to give me that exclusive interview was to inspire other survivors of domestic abuse to know that they can escape the violence and rebuild their lives. And there's much more to that interview as well as Marsha and Jessica talk with me about the Sarah Boone trial. And you can see the extended version of that interview on our Court TV YouTube channel. And if you or someone you know is dealing with domestic violence, please reach out for help. Call the national hotline at the number listed on your screen. Coming up next here on Opening Statements, jury deliberation set to resume in the Byrne Powell murder trial. If Melody Ferris is found not guilty, could the state go after anyone else like her son, Scott? Drew Me to Court TV was this opportunity to combine the two things that I love. When I was in college, I studied television and radio, and then, of course, went to law school. And when I found out that Court TV was going to give me the opportunity to express myself and to share my love of the law, I was sold immediately. The most important issue, innocence or guilt. Started as a production assistant, then AP, and then went up the ranks, and really haven't looked back since. Now for what's tipping the scales of justice, Melody Ferris waiting to learn her fate as the jury is set to resume its deliberations this morning in the Byrne Powell murder trial. And after the verdict comes, we're wondering, could anyone else possibly face charges? And we got this question from you, our wonderful viewers. I've been getting so many questions about this on Twitter and Facebook about Scott Ferris. Because the Melody Ferris defense team is implying that Scott was the one who killed his father. Actually, not even implying, saying that Scott was the one who killed his father. Now, this is something he vehemently denies, and it's obvious the state of Georgia believes him. Take a look. Did you murder your father? I absolutely did not murder my father. Without a doubt, I loved him. Did you have anything to do to help your mother dispose of and burn your father? Absolutely not. Tell me, not me. No. So, if Melody Ferris is found not guilty, I keep getting the question, can the state prosecute Scott? So the short answer to that question is yes. But the more complicated question is, will they? Right? Will they? Let's bring in our guests to talk about this. Still with me, attorneys Dante Mills and Tad Thomas. Okay, so let's go down this road just for the sake of our analysis today. Dante, your prediction earlier on the program, you said you're predicting an acquittal for Melody Ferris. So let's say that happens. What do you think the likelihood is that the state changes its position and decides to initiate a prosecution against Scott then? They may have to because you want you want to bring someone to justice and the state often has that stance. Someone died and someone has to be held accountable for it. The problem is they've taken a position even with their questioning that Scott did not do it. Uh, and when if they decide to move forward with this case, you have to remember that if Melody Ferris is, is found not guilty, she can't be tried again. So as Tad said earlier, if they have coordinated their defense that in her case she's going to blame scott then believe me in scott's case melody could stand up in court and say it was me and there's nothing that anybody could do about it so if this is a coordinated defense 
practically she could end his entire case by acknowledging or, or or admitting that she committed this murder, but if she's already been found not guilty for it, then there's nothing they can do. So it would be a really tough call if, they're, if they've coordinated their defense in this case, and it leaves the, the, the district attorney in a very, very, very sticky position. Right, Dante. Oh, I love that. I love that you shared that with us, because it gives us a lot to think about, right? It, it's clear that uh, there's tension. Right, there's tension. He was not sitting behind his mom during the closing arguments. He was sitting on the state side. Um, her attorney, I mean, literally pointed the finger at him during close uh, and said that it was him who did this. Uh, Tad Thomas, what do you think the likelihood is, let's just say there's an acquittal for the sake of this analysis this morning. What happens then? Does the state reverse course and go after Scott? So Dante took acquittal today. I'm going to take mistrial, uh, but I'm with him. I don't think this is going to be a conviction. What they do after this, unless there is some new evidence, I, I'm with Dante. I don't see how they make this prosecution work. Do they want to hold someone uh, accountable for this? Absolutely, but absent more evidence that they don't currently have, if I'm that prosecutor, I don't take the chance at another acquittal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. And so you would just kind of leave it alone then and just say, well, okay. I mean, and, you know, and they very well may, right? Because if they truly believe, um, and I always stress this on my show, you know, as a prosecutor, um, you don't care which person it is. You're, you just want to have the right person that you're prosecuting. You don't care if it's mom, son, both. You just want to make sure the evidence gets to the proper person. And if you don't have the proper person, ethically, you have to withdraw. So if they really believe it's Melody, and they, they've said so much, Dante, they've said only one person could have done this. Only one person's cell phone puts them there. One person, it's only her. Um, then perhaps things... Uh, just will be uncomfortable in the Ferris home on Thanksgiving, huh? This is a murder mystery, right? Where you have, it's, it's somebody dies. And this is exactly where you, you look at those things where somebody dies in the living room with the, with the a knife, you know, is it the butcher? The, the This is what this case is. It's so many characters around it. But the problem is in a murder mystery, you can guess who's responsible. In a court of law, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And absent some other evidence of somebody saying, I saw an individual do this, where you just have a body in the middle of, of what is it, I believe like 10 acres, where there's so many people around, they can't just, the prosecution shouldn't just be able to just put anybody that's connected in on trial and hope that it sticks. If they don't have further evidence, I think they should leave it if this is case ends in an acquittal or even a mistrial because that's not what they're supposed to be doing, just kind of guessing. They don't have concrete evidence. They stood up and said it was her. If it's not her, how did they then stay up and say, we're absolutely certain it was somebody else unless something new comes out? Mm -hmm. Right, right, Dante. And, and to be very clear, I want to end the segment by saying the state of Georgia is not making any allegations against Scott Ferris. They've been very clear in the testimony. Investigators believe that he had nothing to do with his dad's death. They consider him a victim as he lost his father. All of the children are victims, and our hearts certainly go out to them. Uh, because in this mystery, we know a life was lost. As you said, Dante, you know, Gary Ferris, a prominent Atlanta lawyer who helped a lot of people through his career, uh, he's deceased, and there's nothing that can bring him back, no matter what way this trial goes. Uh, Dante Mills, Tad Thomas, always love having you both on this program. Thank you for everything this morning. Hope you both have a wonderful Halloween holiday. We'll see you soon. And coming up next uh, here, it's Court TV Live Time. That is all for this episode of Opening Statements. If you liked it, share it. We put our episodes up for you on CourtTV.com every day. Just click on that. See that red shows tab right there? Just click that. You can share it there. When we come back, it's time for jury deliberations to resume with Melody Ferris.